Hello, everybody. Oh. Welcome. I, I have a really big voice, and I'm really scared of microphones. Um, <laughs> my name is Shana Plout. Uh, I am the, I'm many things, um, but I guess in this capacity, I am the Director of Research and Exhibition Development here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. I want to thank all of you um, for coming. We're starting 10 minutes late. That happens, but we're starting to say because we have so many people here and so many people who are interested. Um, just want to let you know in terms of the timing, restrooms, food, what else is important? Those are usually important things. And then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Elder Robert Green, who will open us up in, in a good way. Timing um, this uh, event will be ending around 1.30 p.m. Um, it is being filmed. There is also a virtual component because there are people who wanted to join who were unable to do so uh, for a variety of reasons, including one of our panelists. So there is a virtual component uh, and it is being filmed. If you do not want to be filmed, just kind of hang out over there um, and that'll be the non-film section. Um, also want to let you know, and I'm glad to see it, there is food, there should be food, eat, drink, um, and uh, and be merry as we as we go with the fight uh, the fight forward. Restrooms are right down the hall and to your left. Um, and um, this is a really powerful topic, event, yeah. and real life. And uh, I just want to make sure that that folks are able to take care of themselves and take care of each other. Each other. And uh, Elder Robert Green will be opening us up in a good way. Thank you, Shana, very much. My name is Robert Green. I'm the elder in residence for the uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And uh, before I go any further, I want to speak in my language. Anishna Bemoin. Aha bojo dene magane tuk. Nietzsche be matzee get <laughs> Oh, I've been meet up. Oh, I get to keep in it. Oh, I'm snapping at it. Can't stop coming and sing. Oh, I give me busy go what to get. I'm done snapping. Oh, I give me busy keep what. Oh, I get keep busy. I'm not sure go. I do to what. I'm done snapping. But as well, I got to change that thing. I'm just happy to. I'm meet up with them. I'm snapping. Gigi Bond Anisha Nibio Oe Gibo Aug Mita Suez Gagis Makoe Gisamanito Mete Manito Sagima Manito Sagama Manito Ique Oe Machabija Art Gavi Noa Oe Chabija and the Visenda Mort Bija and the Canoab Menunk Canoab Mekoink Chabiju Wawichi Nunk Oe We Noa we know a pitching in the book art. We know one know again a pitcher can the mount no cookie equivalent. No again can a martin and we know a pitcher was so in a is you open the mart to a guinea gani minan. Why gave was so in a better to tana minan. Mita so is a guy is talking about anish where he's not up minauk. Oi, 
आने इनके गहनी जो उस जगाते वो अपने दर्शन जगाते और अनिश में वो जगह की स्था को जाने में शुम्स पे जिम्मे तो अनिश वो नीशो का बन देखो मोस दो तेम नीशो में थे दो का मे <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. By way of introduction, uh, in my language, my name is uh, Two Standing Men, standing in two places at once. I'm named after a spirit that has one foot on the, on the earth and the other foot on the, on the universe. Therefore, it's standing in two places at once. I'm uh, from the Moose Clan. I'm a uh, second degree midday in, the, in our Midewin society. So that is who I am. And where I'm from is uh, we uh, we call our, our my homeland Skatezagegan, um, the people of the shallow water. And I'm very honored again to, to be asked to come and uh, um, do an invocation for this gathering, a very, a very important topic. As I said in my language that what has happened, what's been happening has been ongoing for, uh, for the past uh, 100 years or so. In, uh, in 18, uh, at, I believe it's uh, August 15th, 1877. Stony Mountain Penitentiary was opened. They had an opening at that time. And in 1885, after the Lowy Real Rebellion and uh, all of that conflict that took place, there was three chiefs that were incarcerated mm. in, that, in that penitentiary. One was uh, Chief Poundmaker, Chief Big Bear, and another man by the name of Straight Arrow. One Arrow is his name. They did not speak a word of English. And during the trial, there was uh, an interpreter that interpreted for, for, those, uh, for those chiefs. Big Bear made a, a two-hour presentation on his own defense mm. on the, on this trial the interpreter the interpreter did not accurately translate the words of, of big bear and and so did so as well with uh, chief poundmaker and <clears throat> Both, all three individuals were not even present at that uh, at those at those conflicts, and they were trying to prevent their their own warriors, their own people, from taking part in that. They tried to stop it as 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 best as they could, but it it was uh, it didn't do any good. So they were tried and convicted of treason, mm. felony in 1885. Both were sentenced to three years. 
and the, and the, the other individual, one error, was also convicted of that. And since then, right up to today, all mostly in the individuals, mostly uh, indigenous peoples, have been wrongly convicted of those of those crimes that they did. I worked in uh, corrections for for four years at um, Milner Ridge Correctional Center. And I heard a lot of stories like that. And the some of them were not very uh, very well educated. Mm -hmm. those, uh, those young men, those boys that uh, that provide uh, that I provided counsel to, and some of them did not even uh, speak very good English. They but they spoke their language very well, and. The lawyers that's supposed to defend them told them that to, in order to make things easier for them, that they were advised to plead guilty. And some of those uh, allegedly crimes were were uh, were uh, misdemeanors. What they call mm -hmm. misdemeanors, very uh, not a, not a very serious crime. Mm -hmm. And similar story that has happened in 1975. Again, that has happening been happening since then. The lawyers for the, the, the defense have, <clears throat> have gone on to to become judges on account of those conviction rates that they that they had. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the rule of law. That's not what it's all about in, in these a lot of these cases. It's about their uh, the lawyer. It's about the uh, the law enforcement, the lawyers, the judges, and the system itself. All in there for their own benefit, for their own self interest. Because knowing that they can get a conviction, that they will be rewarded to, to becoming a judge. That has always been a similar story that I've heard throughout these years when I was working in, in that uh, at that correctional facility. So how can we change it? Mm. How can this be changed? since this is a, a long-standing tradition of the Canadian government to incarcerate our peoples that are <clears throat> giving them uh, wrongful dis, uh, convictions. And uh, I just want to, to honor this, at this time, this individual that uh, that were part of the uh, the story that you're going to be hearing in, in this gathering. I just want to mention that on, and honor him as Brian Anderson mm -hmm. and uh, Alan Woodhouse for 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 being here with us. And I want to say miigwech. Thank you for listening. Miigwech. Thank you, Elder Robert. Miigwech, Elder Robert. This is not new. On July 18th, three weeks after I started to work here, at the museum, I stood in the back of that room over there, and I watched as two Anishinaabe men, Alan Woodhouse, who's joining us virtually, and Brian Anderson, who is here with his family, were finally exonerated and had their names cleared 
after 50 years. Ah. I was moved not only by Brian and Alan's strength and humility, but also their humanity, their ongoing reminder that there are many, many, many more people, often indigenous people, who remain wrongfully convicted on their own land and deserve freedom, deserve justice. As both Alan and Brian explained, they do not want what happened to them to happen to others, but it is. But I was also struck by how familiar this all sounded. I turned to Aisha Khan, our CEO here at the museum, and to Professor Nigan Sinclair, who will be facilitating today. And I started to talk about Chicago. I moved to Chicago in 1999. The month that I arrived, the Republican governor, known for slippery and progressive spending habits, but not progressive politics, placed a moratorium on the death penalty, yeah. commuting 167 sentences yeah. to life imprisonment and exonerating 22 people on death row. These people, almost all black men, had been tortured by the Chicago police into confessing to crimes that they had not committed. They were tortured because they were not seen as fully human mm -hmm. because of racism. And it continued and it was protected and it was covered up because of racism. Upon release, many of these torture survivors, including Greg Banks, joining yes. us today virtually, were committed to not only ensuring that other innocent men were released, but that the impunity stopped. These men, working with many allies, such as Alice Kim, present here today, demanded accountability reparations, and healing. One part of this accountability, reparations, and healing is the knowledge of what happened to them in the name of justice. Yeah. And that this injustice is known widely and for generations to come. I was struck by how on both sides of this very new border, through Turtle Island. The system of justice in Canada and the United States, as Elder Robert taught us, was created and continues to be enacted to perpetuate injustice. And this injustice is normalized because people are not seen as fully human. Mm -hmm. Racism in the justice system is not the anomaly, but becomes the lens and the mechanism and the justification. This is not new. This is not right. And as here at the museum, a museum that is devoted to stories, stories that inspire change, these stories must be told and shared in the hopes that collectively we can build something new. That is my purpose behind the event today. Mm -hmm. An event that was organized from the beginning by with the Center for Human Rights Research at the University of Manitoba with the tireless, tireless support and ingenuity of Paul, Dr. Pauline Tennant and with the support here at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. And this event is generously supported by Robson Hall, the law school at the University of Manitoba. But it's often the people that we don't see that make things happen. And I wanna give a big thank you to the facilities and catering team at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights who ensured that we were fed, 
by the way, there's still more food, including gluten-free food. And that we have a place to sit or stand, as you may choose, to the tech team who was working around the clock and isn't supposed to be here, but somehow is still here. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so to make sure that we can hear and see Greg. Hi, Greg. Yes. From Chicago, as well as the graphic recorder, Kara, who is joining us and the people who are joining remotely, including AJ Woodhouse. I also want to thank and acknowledge our ASL interpreters who are ensuring that all people here can engage in the discussion. A big thank you also to my colleague, Rochelle Nakon, our glue, who has been on top of all the logistics, and to the executive team here at the museum, especially Matt and Aisha, who supported this event since the beginning. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Acknowledge people. Yeah. I want to turn this over. Uh, I also want to let you know that there is a reference guide here that is available on the Canadian Museum for Human Rights website, as well as the Center for Human Rights Research website, bilingual French and English on the, on the CMHR's website, that was created by Stephen Carney, our librarian here, as well as Carly Kane, who is a research uh, assistant and a third year law student at Rob Robson Hall from Treaty 3, who put it, worked collectively together to look at racism uh, in, within the criminal justice system on both sides of the border. I now want to turn the event over to Dr. Negan Sinclair, professor of indigenous studies and a often read and often heard journalist and columnist to facilitate this event Innocence Behind Bars, Nigan, Miigwech, and over to you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, how's everybody doing out there? Uh, it's nice to see everybody both in the virtual space and uh, here, right here on Treaty One territory. Welcome to everybody, to the home of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oja Cree, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota peoples, of course, our Inuit and Dene relations, and we are on the homeland of the Red River Métis. Uh, it's nice for everyone to be here, both virtually and uh, physically, and I uh, hope that you all had a few bites to eat, and I hope that you had some visiting over the lunch hour. Um, uh, we're here today to honor uh, and talk about uh, a critically important issue, but the work also that's being done to recognize that work, and uh, perhaps no one you know, most importantly, it's been mentioned a few times is to recognize the incredible sacrifice and commitment to justice that was been demonstrated by Brian Anderson, uh, who's here, and uh, miigwech to Brian and his family, uh, who come from my, partly from my hometown, uh, just north up the Red River in, uh, in Selkirk. And also to greetings to AJ. I know that you're online right now. I want you to know that we uh, we send our great wishes to you and uh, a big miigwech for allowing me to tell part of your story. Uh, and uh, be able to share that with readers of the free press. Uh, on March 8th, 1988, J.J. Uh, Harper, who is a leader, uh, an Indigenous leader, a powerful First Nations voice in our community, uh, was shot by an officer unjustly uh, for simply walking down a street and being in the mm. wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, <clears throat> That set forth a uh, domino effect, a cacophony of motion within our community that it is not by any coincidence that that same week uh, on in March of 1988, uh, my father, Murray Sinclair, was uh, selected to be the first Indigenous judge in Manitoba history in this province, second in Canada. Those two events set forth uh, uh, an experience for me as a young 12 year old boy to experience the justice system firsthand and to have a front row seat to the uh, kind of history that we heard about earlier, which goes back over a century and a half in this place. Uh, this city has been in existence for a very long period of time, uh, but has only been uh, recognized or incorporated as a city for 150 years this year. Uh, it is a place, however, that systemic racism exists very much in the justice system, and that was exposed during the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, which my father and uh, uh, Murray Sinclair and Justice Alvin Hamilton uh, investigated 
And uh, in many ways, uh, I sacrificed my father to the examination of justice in this province. Uh, I got the chance to witness uh, the incredible injustice that led to the murder of Helen Betty Osborne mm -hmm. in, uh, and the perpetuation of those uh, men who perpetrated that heinous crime and kept them free for years. I witnessed the uh, conspiracy amongst policing that mm -hmm. led to officers being uh, held not accountable for those mm -hmm. actions. And when one finally was, instead of facing justice, decided to take oh. his own life. I witnessed uh, the testimonies from people in prisons, uh, in public seminars, the family members that were left behind and as individuals were wrongly convicted, uh, the impacts and the devastation that that took place in our communities, leading to poverty, atrophy, domestic situations, addictions, all of those things that we often attribute to things like residential schools, um, manifest themselves within the justice system. And it is that central core belief that one group of people matter in this country and another group of people don't matter in this country. And that that group of people that don't matter in this country will be locked away as if forgotten about, not just on reserves during the Indian Act, but also in the prisons. And that in the prisons of today, uh, systemic racism continues to be perpetrated and all you have to do is walk down the street uh, and attend any uh, hearing, uh, walk into any communities and see the over-policing that takes place within this community, uh, witness any stories within the stories that we write at the Winnipeg Free Press, and you will see that systemic racism is still very much a part of the life of Indigenous peoples in this city. And the thing about systemic racism that exists within the institutions of this country, and whether you look at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which talked about it, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or uh, the Murder, Missing, Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry final report, uh, which all say basically the same thing, that systemic racism is pervasive, it's something that uh, exists in every segment of society. It's something that we think is, is normalized and is conditioned uh, with particularly within the child welfare system, within the education system, the health system, but most brutally in the justice system. Uh, within every single report, it suggests that uh, the problem ultimately with systemic racism is that people can't see it who perhaps haven't experienced it firsthand or don't think they've experienced it firsthand. But all of us have been impacted in one way or another, either by having a family member or a relative uh, who has been incarcerated wrongly or unjustly, or has been charged, or in the case of myself and every single Indigenous person that I've ever met, has been stopped because we resemble a suspect. Mm -hmm. or in the idea that we as Indigenous peoples, simply by the mere sake of existing, are a problem within the very institutions in which we walk now as employees, as colleagues, as people who are attempting every day, in fact, I was here yesterday with the Winnipeg Indigenous Accord, uh, to remind the private and the public spheres within the city that Indigenous peoples are what you need to be able to move forward, but that workplaces are not always ready for us because deeply held, view, held views are still highly problematic and they aren't just in judges and lawyers, but perhaps that might be a good place to begin. We, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about those things today, but I just want us to recognize that, that this is not a journey that starts with the cases that we witnessed this summer, um, and it's absolutely not something that we will uh, be stopping to do in the future or that we should be slowing down. In fact, if anything, I think we should be stepping up this work, doubling down on this work, doing more work than this than ever on the issue of unjust and uh, um, wrongful convictions within our community, because the fact is that these are continuing to happen and perpetuate themselves uh, an ongoing basis, simply by the mere sake that when we had an Indigenous voice within that system, uh, oftentimes there are many forces that will drive them out. And, and uh, I was with my father just a few hours ago, and I was telling him about this event. And he said that while he was there in the justice system, he began to see change. But almost immediately from the time that he went from the provincial court to the court of Queen's Bench, now King's Bench, or when he went from the Court of King's Bench to later leading the uh, Truth Reconciliation Commission, almost the second that he left, he immediately witnessed the reversal of changes that he had instituted. 
And so we have to remember that that work, this work, will be ongoing for in perpetuity. It will never end, this work. Um, and so we have a wonderful panel today, both online and live here, uh, to be able to talk about this issue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just move over to the table, if that's okay, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> About my pen even so okay. um we also just want to thank uh hannah and scotty just uh give them a little round of applause here for doing their work for our a asl interpreters um uh, i'm i'm joined with a a fantastic uh live panel here and then also uh an online uh i think greg's online i think and uh, we also have a recording artist I'm going to introduce you to, but I just want to introduce you to each person and then I'm going to throw a question at all of you. Uh, so the very first uh, is Amanda Carling. Amanda is the CEO of the BC First Nations Justice Council and has worked a long time on these issues, both in the public and in the private sphere. Please welcome to the stage Amanda Carling. And not quite in that order, but right in the center of the table is uh, who's someone who's become a very good friend of mine, uh, someone who's very well known in the justice community, but someone who uh, has worked tirelessly on this issue for longer than probably anyone. I asked my dad this morning, I said, how, how long do you think James has been working on this? And he says, uh, probably longer than me. So I don't know what that means. So there you go. So uh, James Locke Lock here is the founding director of Innocence Canada. Please welcome James to the stage. <laughs> Uh, next up is Alice. <clears throat> Alice Kim is the director of Beyond Prisons and the Center for Study of Race, Politics and Culture at the University of Chicago. Um, Alice is uh, someone who I've uh, quickly realized is a tremendous resource to me to learn about issues, uh, not just in here in Manitoba, but how uh, uh, unsurprisingly systemic racism in the justice system res resoundingly looks similar. Uh, it's the way in which we deal with it that looks different. So please welcome Alice Kim to the stage. <laughs> Uh, uh, virtually online on the screen that you can see just over there uh, and uh, is uh, Greg Banks, Gregory Banks, who's a torture survivor and safety coordinator uh, from the Chicago Torture Justice Center, uh, Chicago, off in Chicago there. Um, how's the weather out there in Chicago there, Greg? It's cold, really, really, it's real cold here. It's about 22 degrees. Uh, which makes no sense to us up here in Canada. <laughs> Uh, if it was 22 in Canada, we would all be wearing shorts right now. So, <laughs> oh, no, it's cold, man. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think you're talking Fahrenheit, is my point. Is uh, my point. So, is that that's negative four? Oh, that's like shorts weather, man. What are you yeah. talking about? I think today is like, uh, I don't even know. If I said minus 15, you probably think we're all dead. It's probably what you think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please welcome to the stage, Gregory, uh, virtually. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have a recording artist uh, who's joining virtually, uh, doing a kind of visual representation of today. We're very lucky, uh, Kara. C I hope I pronounce your name right, Sevright or Sevright. That's uh, pretty so close. Yeah, Kara Sevright. Um, I'm here on Haida Gwaii, the traditional territory of Haida Nation. Wonderful. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah, just where that is located off um, the north coast of um, BC near Alaska. <laughs> I'm going to bet that you are not minus 22 or whatever. So you're probably beautiful Hello. weather. Yeah. Uh, welcome to everyone, uh, Kara, to our group here. Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, I want to start with you, Amanda. Um, you're uh, coming from the, the BC First Nations Justice Council. Um, what makes you passionate about this work? Uh, maybe talk a little bit about how you came to this work and then uh, why are you here today or what is something that you'd like to share with what, uh, why you came such a long distance to talk about this issue? Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Elder Robert for opening us in a good way and for sharing his language with us, as well as Brian Anderson and Alan Woodhouse, Gregory Ban Banks, and all those who uh, have lived and living experience of having been wrongly convicted. I grew up here on Treaty 1 territory, and um, unlike a lot of Indigenous kids, when the police caught me underage with alcohol, 
because of the color of my skin and where I lived, they took me home instead of taking me to the remand center. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really understand that privilege. And I took it for granted until I had the opportunity to shadow a judge. Uh, I took a second year criminology course at the University of Manitoba, and I was placed with Judge Judith Elliott, Judge Judy. And uh, the statistics of overrepresentation in that courtroom weren't just a reflection of what I had seen in my textbooks. It wasn't 20% of the kids or 30% of the kids were Indigenous. Every single child that came before that court was Native. Mm. These were kids that could have been my cousins. And I went home and it sounds trite, but I remember crying to my mom and saying, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to work to make the justice system better for Indigenous people. In law school, of course, I thought that that was going to look like a practice in uh, criminal defense law, similar to what James did. But I took a course in wrongful convictions. And that's not a mandatory course that you have to take in law school. You would think that if you're going to practice criminal law, you ought to learn a little bit about wrongful convictions, but it's an optional course. And when I was learning from the various commissions of inquiry that have um, taken place in Canada following wrongful convictions about tunnel vision and police and prosecutorial misconduct, um, ineffective assistance of counsel and flawed forensic evidence. I thought, well, if these are all of the things that put middle-class white men like David Milgard and Guy Paul Morin and Thomas Sofino and Ron Dalton at risk, what happens when you add racism? What happens when you have tunnel vision and racism or racist lawyers and racist police plus institutional racism? investigatory techniques and evidence gathering that is highly subjective and done by people who carry with them prejudices against Black, Indigenous, queer, and other folks. In the course evaluation, which was taught by my now friend, Kent Roach, I, I tore him apart for it. And to be fair to him, at this time, 10 years ago, in the innocence movement, it wasn't part of the conversation. This event wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. And one of the greatest ironies of wrongful conviction work is that Donald Marshall Jr., a Mi'kmaq man, was one of the first widely recognized wrongful convictions in Canada. And the Royal Commission in his case concluded that Ro Donald Marshall Jr. was wrongly convicted in part because he was a native. And yet when I was in law school and we talked about the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the justice system, all of the solution thinking started at sentencing. It started at Section 718, 2 sub E in the case of Gladue, and no one said, should Jamie Tannis Gladue have been convicted? Was she wrongly convicted? No one said, I wonder if all of those Native people who are crowding our jails should be there. Following summer, I was offered an articling position with Innocence Canada, working with James. And as an articling student, I came to see how much effort went into trying to undo one wrongful conviction, how hard James and others worked to seek justice for the wrongly convicted. And it broke my heart a million times knowing that even after there was a remedy, even after there was compensation, there's no justice for someone who's been harmed by the system in this way. When I was articling, I worked on the case of Glenna Soon. Glenn was my friend and he spent 17 years in prison and even got a remedy and compensation, but he never got peace. He got bail. And I remember I uh, helped him find a place to live in British Columbia and his wrongful conviction was overturned in 2019. Earlier this year, Glenn died. He got, he died in his sixties, far too young. And I hope that wherever he is now, he's finding peace because there was no peace for him in this life. Glenn, despite his passing, was lucky. He had a James Lockyer and a Phil Campbell and a Sean McDonald, who collectively did thousands of hours of pro bono work to get that remedy. Most wrongly convicted people don't have those advocates. Most people don't have a Joyce Milgard who will chase the Minister of Justice down the hallway to, to argue for her son. And I believe that most of the wrongful convictions that we know about, those that we study and that we teach, are not representative of this problem. Mm -hmm. Canada has had seven commissions of inquiry following wrongful convictions, and the cases that have been studied are, again, middle-class white men's cases for the most part. To remedy this, Kent Roach and I created a new uh, registry of wrongful convictions with support from, from, some, from, a, from some of our former students. It's wrongfulconvictions.ca. Um, one of the most shocking findings, or I don't know if it's shocking or not, but it's nice that we were able to to um, have some data finally to say, in the history of this country, at a time where 50% of the federally incarcerated female population is Indigenous, 
there are only two Indigenous women who've ever received a remedy for a wrongful conviction. Two. So I come to this, this event and I come to this work um, to come home, of course, but also um, because I want to know who else has to be on that list, whose name should be on the list of wrongful convictions. Miigwech. Oh, miigwech. Uh, <clears throat> There's a reason why this event is not just about uh, Canada or not just about Manitoba, although certainly uh, I think we've the the lens has really been posed on Manitoba for us and for those of us in the most of many, many of us in the room. Uh, we want to expand the lens a little bit as a part of this to talk about systemic racism in uh, in unjust sentencing, unjust uh, convictions. Um, but we, by inviting Greg Gregory in, uh, Gregory's coming all to us all the way from Chicago. Um, Gregory, what? Uh, what brings you to this work? Why are you passionate about this work? Uh, maybe if you could, for a lot of the people that are here, is share a little bit of your experience, um, and then maybe perhaps share also a little bit about uh, what it is that you'd like us to take away from the issue of wrongful convictions. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank everybody that's on the panel. Um, this is, um, I said while I was incarcerated, I said, if I ever got out of this situation, that I was going to do everything that I possibly could do to stop what I've seen. Uh, these wrongful convictions, um, and it's a lot of them. Uh, a lot of times people believe that uh, if you are arrested, then you must have did something. And that's not the truth. Um, I am going to uh, never will I uh, not do anything. You know, people help me, um, and I remember uh, this. It's been it's been forty years. Forty years is a long time uh, since this incident took place uh, in nineteen eighty three. That's a long time, and and it and it and every time I talk about. Uh, my situation it you know I, I go back to that to them to them days when when what happened to me happened and uh you know I think about all of those guys and women that are still incarcerated that are innocent and even if and even if they are they weren't innocent uh the, if they were beaten in this country you know they uh, uh she, America said they don't beat their their citizens. Yes, yes, you do. Uh, and it's been proven, even though uh, Chicago has become the false capital, not just of the United States, but probably of the world. Uh, it is so many. I mean, you know, just when when you take when you when you take somebody out of their out of society and put them in a situation that they probably a lot of them not going to get out of prison is absolutely a prison is not prison is wrong prison doesn't work man it does not work uh you know they they talk about uh longest sentencing then uh whatever they say they it, it's not it doesn't change anything and it and it and it hasn't changed anything, and so uh, I'm going to walk this life. I'm going to be in this, however long it takes. I'm not going to stop. You know, I have to remember the people that, if it had not been for people like Alice Kim, if it had not been for the People's Law Office and the Wilson brothers and John Conroy, I don't even think that. Y'all probably, this would probably never have happened. But because John Conroy, the People's Law Office, and the Wilson brothers had the courage to tell what happened to them, that's why I'm here. That's why I had the opportunity. I am the first one to have my conviction overturned and walk out of the penitentiary. Mm -hmm. I was the first one. and. I, I had no idea until I read the House of Screams. Now, this was a John. Let me, let me go back a little bit. John Conroy did a lot of research. He 
he went back to see. He wanted to know, man, you know, people was talking about they were beating that area to violent crime. So he did research. He, he wrote an article called The House of Screams. And in this article, there were so many individuals that had been beaten, tortured by John Burge and his midnight crew. And, and believe it or not, I was I thought I was by myself. But when I read that and I seen that I wasn't by myself, I'm, I'm saying y'all that I hated that that happened. But I was glad that I wasn't the only one that had been tortured by John Burge and his midnight crew. And so I, you know, I all I give John, I give John Conroy, and I'm gonna say it again, the People's Law Office and the Wilson brothers, if it had not been for them, none of this would have been possible. So I, I have to uh uh thank them. And, and and that is why, you know, this this fight that we are in is it's a fight. And we gotta keep fighting. We can't stop no matter what. You know, it's still people that's that it's, it's so many people that's been wrongfully convicted that's still trying to get out of those pen, the penitentiaries. And we trying our best to get them out. And so we're going to continue to do what we're doing. Thank you. Alice? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, Alice, can you, um, uh, I, I don't want to interrupt you, Gregory. Were, were you done, Gregory? Sorry. Yeah, I was done. I was done. Okay. Yeah, miigwech. Um, thanks so much. Um, Alice, I, I want to throw it to you a little bit because I don't think some of our audience would know maybe a little bit of the context of what things Gregory was speaking about. But then on top of that, what, what brought, brought you to this work and coming from such a far distance? It's funny, you know, oftentimes Winnipeg is called the Chicago of the North. I'm not sure if you're, if you're aware. And I think that things that... <laughs> When Gregory was speaking, uh, I think we we're often talking about the wind, but in this case, we might be talking about the racism. And mm -hmm. certainly there is a lot of parallels with Winnipeg, uh, the kind of uh, you know, unjust convictions and that Gregory's talking about. He could be very much talking about Indigenous peoples too. Um, can you give some context to that and talk about your own work? Sure, absolutely. I mean, first I want to say, hey, Greg, <laughs> it's hey. so good to see you virtually. Wish you could be here with us. Me um, too. So folks know Greg was one of the leaders of the um, reparations movement in Chicago. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about that later, but Greg has been on the ground fighting for justice for Chicago police, torture survivors and beyond um, for, for decades. So thanks so much, Greg, for being here. And now he actually works at the Chicago Torture Justice Center, which is um, the only domestic center that provides psycholog psychological counseling services and supports the services um, to domestic survivors of police torture in the United States. So just wanted to offer a shout out to Greg. I also want to give a really warm welcome home to Brian Anderson. I see you there and uh, thank you so much for being here. And Alan Woodhouse, um, who I don't see, but I, I understand that he's here um, virtually. Um, what happened to you is so strikingly um, similar um, to the Chicago police um, torture cases. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, over the course of nearly two decades, um, from 1972 to 1991, um, former Commander John Burge um, and his midnight crew, that's what they were called, of all white detectives, systematically tortured more than 117 Black people. Um, you heard a little bit um, about what Greg experienced. Um, and this happened over the course of two decades. Um, there are approximately 117 documented cases, but we know that the web of torture goes beyond um, these 117. And I actually got involved in the work um, in the late 1990s. Um, it was um, with a group of men who had all been tortured by John Burge, um, who were on Illinois' death row. Um, so they self-organized um, because they were getting nowhere in the courts um, uh, appealing their cases. They self-organized actually through law classes um, that they also organized themselves um, at Pontiac um, Correctional um, Facility or Pontiac Prison. Um, 
a man named Stanley Howard. You'll see, I have some images that I'm going to share with you in just, in just a bit. Um, but they self-organized themselves and they called themselves the Death Row 10. I was a young organizer with a group called the Campaign to End the Death Penalty. Um, at the time. So I had the privilege and the honor of being able to get to know um, the men um, who had organized the Death Row 10 campaign um, and their and their families. Um, and I will say, um, so I think that I, I'm here and part of this conversation, I'm not a lawyer, right? But also to say to people that there is a role for you, we need fierce lawyers, right? Like Amanda and James, but there is a role for all of us um, to organize and to work against um, these injustices. And uh, back in the late 1990s, the Death Row 10, they wrote a letter um, to the campaign to end the death penalty asking us to be their voice on the outside, because when you're on death row, when you're behind bars, you're effectively disappeared from your communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so we took it, uh, we took on their their call to action. And um, I was able to um, visit um, folks, um, visit and meet with and co-organize. Um, we thought of ourselves as co-strugglers. We worked hand in hand with um, those who were on death row um, and um, their family members. So that that's what brought me to this work. And what I've seen is that at every step of the way, while it was so important, <laughs> The, the, the fierce lawyering that was happening in the courtrooms, it was equally as important to have um, a battle on the streets, right? And to be organizing in the streets. And actually um, in, 19, in the late 1980s, it was the unlikely case of someone named, a tortured survivor named Andrew Wilson, who had been convicted of killing two white officers. Um, he actually filed um, a pro se, um, he, he filed a, 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 a civil suit on his own. Ultimately, later, the People's Law Office would take on the case and come to represent him. But alongside that, you began to see the beginnings um, of a movement. And that movement and that campaign grew so that years later, decades later, in 2015, um, we were actually able to pass legislation, municipal um, legislation um, by the city of Chicago, unheard of um, reparations ordinance. Um, and I will start showing just a few slides right now. Um, reparations ordinance that offered some modicum of justice to police torture survivors. So there were six planks of the ordinance that you can see there, but people often make the mistake calling it a legal settlement. It was not a legal set settlement. We were not able to get these measures mm -hmm. through the courts. And I think that's important. Um, there was financial settlement to torture survivors. Um, there was a, a, a curriculum that was developed and is now taught to all eighth and 10th graders about mm -hmm. um, the John Birch torture cases. Um, there is was the Chicago Torture Justice Center that was built, the community center on the south side of Chicago, free education to community colleges, um, not just for the survivors themselves. Many of them felt that they were now older and were not going to go to college, but we know that trauma is intergenerational. So there was an insistence that free college be provided to grandchildren. Um, and then the last and final plank of um the ordinance um, was a permanent memorial um, to the survivors that is currently being um, built. Um, yeah. So I wanted to share that, but then also wanted to just share a few pictures because we bring greetings um, from the survivor community in Chicago. We have been able to build a really loving, strong, fierce community. Um, next slide. <clears throat> over the years. So here's just some ephemera, <laughs> just so you can see the kind of flyers. This was back in the day when flyers mm -hmm. were something else. We didn't have all the apps that uh, we have today. Next slide. Oops. That's all right, we can also come back to it. I think folks, all right. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back. I just wanted to show some photos of our survivor community. Um, 
so that you could see um, see people's um, faces. Um, but we can come back to that later. Yeah, we can come back to it uh, while we get some of the tech issues uh, sorted out. We want to, uh, I mean, time is so precious, of course, and we want to um, give it also an, a chance for the audience to ask some questions at some point. But we want to turn to you, James. Uh, James has uh, been a part of uh, Innocence Canada as founding director, um, has been involved in cases all across the country, and uh, spends a lot of time and energy to give platforms to others. Mm -hmm. And so I think oftentimes my first conversation with James is how can we get uh, uh, interest and awareness around what happened this summer in the Indigenous community. Uh, James, what brings you to uh, this work and what also drives your passion to doing countless hours uncredited to try to do, uh, you know, deal with this issue, which is pervasive across the justice system? Well, I mean, it's really the, the simplest way of saying it is, it, it, is it's the strength and courage of people like uh, Brian Anderson and A.J. Woodhouse. But to 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 explain how I got here, um, I uh, immigrated to Canada when I was in my uh, uh, in my twenties uh, from England, and before I left England, I saw. Uh, a number of cases of wrongful convictions that became notorious uh, with titles such as the Birmingham Six, uh, the Guildford Four, uh, the Maguire Seven. Uh, they did it in large numbers in England when they wrongly convicted people. Um, and they were all cases of Irish men and women uh, convicted wrongly in England uh, of uh, bombings, uh, carried out by the IRA during the course uh, of the IRA campaign uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and it told me how a political environment that generated racism could turn into the prosecution and persecution of innocent men and women. I never forgot it. And I always hoped that I would have an opportunity to start something uh, in Canada uh, that could uh, look at uh, the cases of people who have been convicted of crimes they didn't commit. It was a case uh, of a man called Guy Paul Moran, who Amanda mentioned, uh, who was wrongly convicted in 1992 of the rape murder of a nine-year-old girl uh, in a small town uh, in Ontario. That gave me that opportunity. He was uh, a student, a musician, uh, who became uh, an extraordinary victim of a police focus, a rush to judgment, police desperation, tunnel vision, call it what you will, to solve uh, a dreadful crime. He was convicted of that crime. He was eventually exonerated in 1995 through post-conviction DNA testing. And then in 2020, they finally identified through that DNA uh, who the real perpetrator of the murder of Christine Jessup was. She was the nine-year-old girl, the victim of the murder. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the real perpetrator uh, had uh, killed himself uh, some years before uh, he was identified through that DNA. And Guy Paul's case had some of the features of, uh, of the Anderson Woodhouse cases in that there was a police focus, but the difference, of course, was that the police focus in their case was born from a desire to find a culprit based on pure, unadulterated racism. And indeed, in their case, the irony is that it probably arose as well out of the identity of the victim. The victim was a Chinese immigrant, an immigrant from China. And throughout the proceedings, he was referred to as the Chinaman, mm. by the judge, prosecution, and indeed by the defense lawyers. The elder told us about the three chiefs back in the late 19th century who were convicted at a trial where they didn't understand the proceedings because they didn't speak English. And by gum, that's exactly what happened to two of the four men charged back in 1973 uh, with uh, the murder 
of Mr. Fong that led to the convictions of Brown, AJ, and two other men. Two of them didn't speak English either. They spoke Salto. And yet they were alleged to have made confessions in proficient, fluent English. Quite extraordinary. Mm. After Guy, or during uh, Guy Paul Moran's case back in 1992, I was fortunate enough to come to know someone who you probably have all heard of, Ruben Hurricane Carter. Mm. Ruben was living in Toronto at the time. He came on board with us and we founded an organization called the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. And we've had a number of successes, perhaps our best known, Stephen Truscott, a 14-year-old boy convicted of murder in Goderich, Ontario, and sentenced to death for a murder he didn't commit. And Bill Mullins Johnson, an Ojibwe man, convicted of the murder of his four-year-old niece, a crime that no one committed. She died of natural causes. I thought I'd just read to you to give you an idea of the inherent racism involved in Brian and AJ's case and the other two uh, Woodhouses, Clarence uh, oh, and okay. Russell Woodhouse, give you an idea that that racism wasn't just in the prosecution, it wasn't just in the defense lawyers, but it was in the judge. In other words, it was right throughout the system, including the judicial system. Listen to these words of the court when he sentenced Russell Woodhouse, one of the four men. This is what he said in sentencing him. This is not a jungle that we live in. It is not a wild land. We are not subduing this land from anybody. We are not still taking it from wild people. Can you imagine? That's a judge of our then Queen's Bench speaking in the most abhorrent uh, racist language. And that's why I'm here. Uh, and that's why Innocence Canada uh, exists because these kinds of injustices, we can help. We're not the only solution by any stretch of the imagination. Just look at on my left and on my right and what we're hearing as well on screen. But we have uh, a role uh, that we can play and we're playing uh, to the best of our ability. I, I, you know, at the the free press, uh, or an ongoing, there's an ongoing team investigating the trend in Manitoba of uh, a, an ongoing series that look very similar of injustices perpetrated by certain individuals, and that can be named. However, we won't name here because we're because the investigation's still on, undergoing. Um, but it's very difficult to try to get these records or prove an ongoing method of, of systemic discrimination, particularly because it's often called hearsay or it's often called, uh, you know, oh, like I'm thinking about the number of people that would talk about that judge. I put that in my column, that quote, and the mm -hmm. number of people that go, oh, well, that's just, a, just it was what you said in those days and sort of an excuse. Amanda, what is the challenges of this work? And in the on the ongoing dealing of wrongful convictions, we're often talking about uh, convictions that are at a time period in which even records are difficult to discern or evidence to overturn cases. But what are some of the challenges that are faced in these kinds of cases? Um, yeah, I think now we're at a place where we're talking about the problem, which is great. That's, you know, a big difference that I've seen just in my short career. Um, but we're not seeing a lot of bold and courageous action. So I mentioned we've had seven commissions of inquiry with 300 plus recommendations. So this isn't a situation where your car is making a funny noise and you don't know what's wrong with it. You don't know how to fix it. We know the answers and your dad found a lot of those answers for us through the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry of Manitoba. We love in Canada to write a report and then put it up on a shelf and let it get dusty. I was actually going to say you it's really tough to find copies of the report uh, online or so on. Absolutely. Yeah, it's I, like still on beta. Even though it's in it, the internet. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you know, people like to make excuses. I hear a lot in my work, um, you know, Amanda, that's not how the government works, you know, or people say that's above my pay grade. But I think the biggest impediment to change is that the justice system, the folks working in the justice system who can make the change are terrified to change it because it might mean that they're out of a job mm -hmm. right now. Um, the Justice Council in, Canada, or in British Columbia is a, uh, preparing to take responsibility for the delivery of legal aid services. And a lot of that involves engagement with community members so that we can build it better. But we're also meeting with lawyers because we know that it's hard to make a living as a criminal defense lawyer who's working on certificates. The system is not set up to help lawyers help their clients. In fact, it's the opposite. And despite this huge opportunity that we have for change in a huge jurisdiction, the lawyers are terrified. They're terrified that we are going to take away their bread and butter. And at every lawyer engagement that we've held, at least one person has said, I've worked really hard to build relationships with my clients. And we say, we don't give away frequent flyer points. This isn't a situation where we want to see people coming back again and again and again. In this industry, as a defense lawyer, you shouldn't want to see someone again. You should serve them once, look at everything around them that led them to that situation, and help them get the support so that you're not seeing them again. We're not in the business of giving out frequent flyer points. Similarly, if we fund, defund corrections, as our justice strategy in BC talks about, and put those resources into running land-based programs, it's going to mean that some people are going to lose their jobs. And Elder Robert has talked about this this morning, uh, today already. Um, the legal profession rewards people who are making their living on Indigenous pain. Mm -hmm. um, it boils down to a lack of humility. And if people really want to see change, they're going to have to give up some of that power. Uh, we're, I've got permission here um, to, we're going to go just a slightly longer than we had originally expected. So uh, about 145. So those of you that are, uh, but we, we really want to give an opportunity for questions. So there are some questions that are floating around out there. Um, we're going to get to that. Gregory, um, what do you see as the uh, greatest opportunity for change by dealing with this issue or the areas of change that perhaps you see the most amount of growth in, in the work that you've done now for several decades. Um, and uh, maybe give a message to our audience here of uh, why might they have, but why, why might they want to care about this kind of change? Let's say that there's someone who's just come and interested today at the museum and walked into the room. Uh, why would they want to care about this issue? Uh, uh, first of all, because I'm going to answer the last question for the last part of that, uh, because we are in this life together. And so we have to we have to learn how I think that people have to I think that one of the biggest problems that we have is, especially in America, is uh, racism. We will not talk to each other. Uh, I think we need to we have we need to have an open dialogue. We need to talk to each other because we all I mean all we all I think that all of us want the same thing. You know we want a house, we want a car, we want we don't want to have money in the bank. We want to take care of our families. That's I mean I think that everybody wants to do that, but I also think that you have to make people aware of what is going on because a lot of people just simply don't understand the criminal justice system they don't understand it so uh and until we can until we can make not make but until we uh um uh allow people or make people aware of what is going on it's going to continue to be the same way it is so you got to have people like us all of us that is fighting this system uh, it's, I mean, racism is, is, is systemic. Uh, we want to get rid of these carceral systems that uh, continue to uh, to be in our world. We need to remove them from this world. Uh, and I think that uh, the work that I've seen, the work that I'm doing, I mean, it's it's going it's it's going to take a lot. It's gonna take a lot, and it's not easy, man. Because everybody not gonna, everybody not gonna be a part of that because they don't want to. See, people really will. See, people are so. Let me just say this too: 
people are so preoccupied with their own lives that they're not even paying attention. They 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 just thinking about raising their family, paying their bills, going to work, coming home, going home. So I don't know, man. I think that man, we just gotta keep doing what we do to make people aware, man. And I'm gonna keep on doing what I'm doing. Uh and I think all of us need to uh be made aware of what's going on on this planet that we call Earth. Alice, do you see uh their change happening and um, do you see what are the areas of growth that are happening within the justice system? Because uh, the, here's the I think I, as an educator, it's sometimes the justice system is easy to teach mm-hmm. <laughs> because, you know, when you get into the areas of child welfare or you get into the areas, there's you know, people can say, oh, well, these parents don't you know, they, they don't deserve to be parents or et cetera. And there's all this kind of opinions you can have about it. And, but mm-hmm. like when you see the justice system and you're starting to talk about white supremacy, right. Mm-hmm. And people are always mm-hmm. scared of saying the word white supremacy. Mm-hmm. The justice system is pretty easy to look at. You go, who's in jail, Brown mm-hmm. people, right. 95% of them. And then who's making the decisions to send them to jail? Mostly white people, 95% right. of them. Like it's, if you want to see white supremacy, the justice system <laughs> is the perfect example. Yeah where there's no argument. It is very clear that white supremacy is at work. And this isn't even an opinion. You just have to look at a picture, you know? Uh, Where's the areas of growth that you see within the system that might be evoking change in a in in a way that Gregory's talking about, giving some of that hope? Excuse me. Hold on. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought the conversation. Um, to white supremacy because I think that what happened with the Birch torture cases, what happened with um, Greg um, could not have happened if we didn't have um, a criminal punishment system that is steeped in racism and white Mm -hmm. supremacy. Um, So I think that one of the areas um, where we need to really challenge ourselves, and I do think that this is the right moment for it because I think with um, the Black Lives Matter movement, we were all introduced to um, the idea of prison abolition, um, Mm. ideas of, you know, um, police abolition, you know, but I think really asking us to rethink um, the punishment system as we know it, right? And I think that that is something that we need to do. So one of the things I want to raise, I know that this is a panel that was organized around wrongful convictions and innocence. And I think that in Illinois, we do. We had 22 exonerations of people who are on death row. Um, Mm -hmm. The question of innocence kicked the door open for us to really think about the carceral system, um, the punishment system, the legal system, and, and question it. But I think that we actually need to look beyond that too. Greg um, alluded to this earlier in some of um, his comments. Um, I'll just share a very quick story. When I was organizing with the Death Row 10 around the campaign to end the death penalty, um, you know, we were very focused on cases of innocence. Um, Although justice for the Death Row 10, we were not at that time claiming innocence for every member of the Death Row 10. We were saying people were tortured into giving confessions, right? Our demand at the time was not a radical demand. Our demand was evidentiary hearings that could lead to a new trial um, with a confession thrown out, right? Mm -hmm. Seems very reasonable. Um, To this day, some people that demand has not been met, even though we witnessed remarkable um, convictions being overturned, Mm -hmm. people walking off of death row, people coming outside of prison previously having either life sentences um, or death sentences. It was all remarkable, all needed. But back then, um, uh, someone who now has forged his way to freedom, um, a man named Ronaldo Hudson, who is part of our um, community um, in Chicago, he asked me at the time, he was also on death row. He was not one of the death row 10, but worked very closely with them. He had formed Ronaldo Hudson Mercy Committee, and he had he forged his own pathway to freedom as someone who admitted guilt and um, was transformed and had transformed himself. And today he's out um, free. Um, 
Mm. And um, he had asked me at the time, what about the rest of us, right? Mm -hmm. And what about the guilty? And I Mm -hmm. think we need to ask that question. And this is a moment that we need to be asking our questions. He often says, you know, the state of Illinois felt that there was nothing irredeemable about me, but he is now on the outside. He is the director of education for the Illinois Prison Project. And he, like Greg Banks and so many others, are fighting the fight to create more pathways to freedom for people who are inside. I also teach at a maximum security prison. And many of my students, um, you know, they they are not necessarily, they don't necessarily have cases of innocence. Many of them do, right? And they need to be, and they are fighting those legal battles, but some of them don't. And we need to question a legal system that doesn't allow for an uh, opportunity for people to actually admit guilt and still have a pathway um, to freedom. So those are some of the questions I think I want to throw into this conversation and Mm -hmm. ask us all to start thinking about um, as well. I mean, Gregory was quite clear saying the prison system doesn't work. And um, having worked in the prison system myself, the youth prison system, just uh, just funny, like when you when you work within the, the system itself, I would always refer to the young men that I worked with as my students. But to get other people to refer to those individuals as my students, just just to humanize them mm-hmm. uh, was a struggle. People would always say inmates or number whatever, or mm-hmm. like, be like they have a name and they're my student, right? right? Um, uh, James, uh, my dad still asked me, when am I going to get a real job? And so uh, because he wants to me to become a lawyer, um, I, don't, I don't think I'm 47. I think it's a little late by now, but but here's what he means by that. He sort of sees that's the call to action. (laughs) The first wave of Indigenous peoples at at the University of Manitoba, one of the very first places in which Indigenous peoples are attending university in the early 1970s, late 1960s, the entirety of them become lawyers. And I think that's the kind of stuff that Alice is speaking about in terms of that kind of wave of of people who are engaged in the legal system. But Mm -hmm. Um, the problem, of course, is that uh, my father has this kind of speech that he gives to first year law students. And it's basically good luck uh, because the it's because the law, the, the law is inherently racist. It's in it's based in the idea that indigenous land, uh, indigenous rights, indigenous peoples don't matter. And that it just there is nothing that is redeemable about indigenous peoples going back to the royal proclamation, the papal bulls. But then when Canada makes all of that law, which is that indigenous rights don't matter, uh, they don't exist other than to be controlled by the state. And therefore, we get prisons. I mean, it's a very one plus one equals two equation was the law. So we shouldn't be surprised (laughs) when we see wrongful wrongful convictions. James, my big question to you is. Uh, with a fundamental problem that it is the law and that to uh, change the system, you have to almost break the law or demand that the law be broken. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you then work within a legal system as a lawyer uh, to both ad- advocate for the law, but then break it at the same time? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, it can be very depressing sometimes, but, but some <laughs> that's the depressing question, sir. Yes. <laughs> Hence why I'm not a lawyer, by the way. Um, yeah. But, you know, sometimes it can be very rewarding as well. And and uh, you know, a note of cautious uh, optimism in Canada. Um, one of the things for uh, more than 30 years we've been advocating for at Innocence Canada is we need to change the system uh, that we have at the moment that's supposed mm-hmm. to regress uh, mm-hmm. and, and identify uh, miscarriages of justice and wrongful convictions. The present process is you have to go to the Minister of Justice in Ottawa. Obviously, not a a very desirable process to have to go through, and we've been urging for years that we need uh, an independent tribunal to address claims of wrongful conviction and an independent tribunal able to provide redress for them. And right now, uh, before Parliament, uh, is Bill C forty, which creates just such uh, an independent. Uh, commission and tribunal. It was put forward by the former Minister of Justice, uh, David Lametti, and it's supported by the present minister, Minister uh, Varani. And we are confident that it is going to become the law uh, sometime uh, next year, as long as the NDP hangs in, at least with the uh, the Liberals. (laughs) Um, And what, what that will do is it will take 
away from uh, the minister, obviously an interested party, take away from the minister completely the power to decide on whether or not uh, a particular conviction is a wrongful conviction and vested in the hands of an independent tribunal, which we hope and indeed the bill demands uh, would uh, be run by uh, people who are familiar with the causes and consequences uh, of wrongful convictions. And interestingly enough, the, the bill uh, includes uh, a clause uh, or two clauses that relate particularly uh, to the indigenous uh, and to black people uh, who are, not surprisingly, uh, the most common victims uh, of miscarriages of justice. It does it, first of all, in terms of the constituents uh, of the commission to be, that they must be representative uh, of our society and in particular representative of the indigenous and the black communities. And as well, when it comes to identifying a wrongful conviction, there is specific reference. I'll read it to you. It says the bill, and this, as I say, it was put forward by the liberals. In making its decision, the commission must take into account the distinct challenges that applicants who belong to certain populations face in obtaining a remedy for a miscarriage of justice with particular attention to the circumstances of indigenous or black applicants. Now, that's not a panacea that's going to solve our problems, but it's a, it's a big step to me in the right direction, that the fact that an indigenous person or a black person saying I've been wrongly convicted automatically you might say, has an advantage. They don't get many advantages in this life, but here they have statutory advantage in their application before this commission uh, to be. So you're not going to solve all the problems. And one of the things that this commission doesn't include within it is the power to review sentences. And that's unfortunate. Commissions in other jurisdictions that are like this one being created uh, do uh, embrace uh, the, the power uh, for the commission to review sentences. And when you consider particularly the uh, the indigenous populations in our prisons, both men and women, uh, and consider the disproportionate numbers, uh, mm -hmm. it seems to me, and we've pushed hard with both the present minister and the previous minister, it seems to me that this is uh, an ideal opportunity to address those inequities to some extent, again, it's it's not going to solve the whole problem by any means, but it can help towards a solution to mm -hmm. our problems in our prisons if yeah. this commission also has the power uh, to review uh, review sentences when it's the indigenous who get the severest sentences of all. Uh, and it's so crucial that that, uh, that that tribunal be independent from the government and from the minister, mm -hmm. because what happens, and we've done investigative reports at the Free Press, our former colleague, uh, Ryan Thorpe, led this, um, the independent investigative unit of uh, policing in Manitoba continually and consistently, surprise, surprise, made up of former mm -hmm. officers, mm -hmm. find current officers uh, not not culpable, uh, not guilty, and consistently over and over and over again, find them not uh, responsible for the harm that is done during policing. Surprise, surprise. So you needs to be independent, must be independent, um, or the whole question of the process comes into play. So absolutely, that independence is crucial. Uh, we want to open it up. We have about uh, eight, nine minutes left, um, and we want to open it up to members of the audience who'd like to ask uh, either our panelists here or Gregory on the virtual space. Uh, but before we do that, while you're thinking of a question, we just want to check in with Kara. Um, how are you doing, Kara, there with your uh, recording? Uh, we've sort of been seeing it out in the corner there. Um, as we go, and uh, just wanted to check in with you, Kara, that you're doing okay, that you're, uh, uh, if you've got any questions or anything that you need. Maybe you're um, muted. Oh, there you are. There you go. Um, oh, I wasn't sure if you could see my screen while I was. We can, yeah, we can see your screen great there, so we're really appreciating mm -hmm. it. Oh, okay, great. Okay, that's all then. Um, yeah. I want you to know that my employer is going to be very impressed that you put the University of Manitoba logo <laughs> is, and the... Uh, uh, that there's a logo right there, but of course the involvement of the university in my uh, work mm -hmm. 
fantastic. And miigwech to all of my colleagues to do this work. So I can only see it out of the corner of my eye, so I can't quite see it all. But um, uh, can we, uh, is there any questions out there that we'd like to ask? And is there a microphone or are we just going to sort of do it according to uh, speech? It is a fairly small room, so. No, no, no microphone. So just, um, is there any question or anything or comments that you'd like? Yeah, go ahead. And if you could just introduce yourself uh, just so that we can get it on the recording. So. Hi, I'm Anita Southall, and I'm actually a recently retired lawyer, having done civil litigation for 36 years. So, um, but what I what I wondered actually, and, and Mr. Lockyer, you you really referenced in a way um, what's anticipated in the legislation is in each of these um, wrongful wrongful conviction challenges. Um, do you have to reinvent the wheel? In the sense that if you find, you know, the racism in the transcripts, etc., is there any evolution in favor of any kind of presumption um, with respect to the way an individual was treated by the system? Or with each case, does that have to be distinctively established? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, we uh, address each case distinctively. I think we have to. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, in the case of uh, Bron and AJ, uh, we addressed it primarily in the context of the uh, obvious uh, racism uh, involved in the police investigation, the prosecution, the defense, I hate to say, but true, uh, and of course the judiciary as well. Uh, the system as a whole, and then followed, of course, by the parole system, which uh, 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 works very strongly against uh, the uh, the indigenous. I, uh, you talk to uh, A.J. Woodhouse, Alan Woodhouse. Uh, he was in. He he got uh, a life sentence and was eligible for parole after ten years. He had to wait twenty three years before he got parole. Uh, why? Uh, because he insisted on his innocence, mm. and uh, his parole officer. Uh, essentially, it, it's in a report. His parole officer reported on on how uh, uh, AJ's problem was. Uh, he was too busy blaming the white man for his problems, mm. and that he was a racist. Mm. He was actually accused in the parole papers of being a racist towards white people uh, because of his attitude. Um, but but we do have to deal with it at an individual level. But this new legislation uh, does give us a chance to address it somewhat at a systemic level and and where the indigenous and, and black people are concerned. And I think that's really good. Um, and and uh, the, the former minister, David Lametti, is to be credited with that. Um, he, uh, he he had a great has great belief in this legislation that he put forward. And indeed, the, the beauty of it is its title. Its short title is is. Uh, the uh, David and Joyce Milgard Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really uh, gives you the feel for what uh, uh, is trying to be done here. And, and we're very supportive of it, of course. Uh, Alice, I, um, just because I don't think a lot of people might get the US context, is there any, I, I, maybe I'm just, this is just absurd, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, just because, you know, when we look down to the United States, sometimes we sort of just cringe and we go, oh, that's, mm -hmm. um, because so many of these things are often state-driven, but we might not know about some of the things that are happening. Is there anything similar happening in the United States, any kind of legislation uh, that is something either on the horizon or something that's been put into play that's really working in any state? Mm -hmm. any? In, um, well, in Illinois, we're actually um, fighting for parole legislation, right? So Illinois abolished the parole system in 1978. So no one has access to discretionary parole. Um, so this bill was actually authored by people um, who are inside who started um, an, an organization themselves called Parole Illinois. And I think that's something that's on the cusp um, that we need to pass. And this is specific to Illinois because other states do have parole, but it's something that's not um, very widely known. Um, but I do think that the reparations ordinance that was passed in 2015 um, we've learned from other countries that, you know, reparations is an ongoing battle itself. So in Chicago, we're continuing to um, fight for reparations, to expand reparations. This was limited to just, you know, burge torture survivors who were tortured between a certain 
or tortured directly by birds. We know that torture exists beyond that. So I think continuing to look to reparations as a new framework for thinking about how you can actually seek um, justice um, and redress for people who have been harmed um, by by the system. So um, those are just two two things that we're, one that we're working on and one that I think provides a model for what we can continue to work on here in, um, in, in Chicago, but also um, nationally and elsewhere. I mean, one of these issues is there's a fundamental problem in government or the idea of government, uh, so-called democracy, in that, and the reason is, is because uh, just at the whims of a government, they can come in and just change whatever. I mean, there used to be a fund with the federal government to, and, a, and a body of people, so many of which were really powerful, strong indigenous peoples in Manitoba, that would fund court cases for constitutional challenges. Um, just, I can't remember what the name of that committee was. Remember? I can't remember. But and then, of course, uh, Stephen Harper defunded that because it ended up uh, being in the way of passing legislation, uh, because immediately then people would make constitutional challenges based because the the legislation itself would be problematic. Um, but the other, you know, every time you sort of see a step in the tribal courts direction in the United States, uh, then what you get is you get the Supreme Court, which will just repeal it um, and repeal 150 years, uh, as we saw most recently with uh, Judge Kavanaugh wrote that decision, which said that tribal courts must tribal courts must supersede the state courts, which just reduces or just rejects tribal law and tribal tribal courts that are trying to bring in restorative justice practices to keep people out of jails and in community, for example, so they can parent as alongside of their sentence for often misdemeanors. And so it's saying no state legislation or state courts are the only ones that matter. And so the Supreme Court court kind of just rejects at the whims of whoever's ever appointed uh, just democratically appointed laws. And, and so that's why the struggle still continues and, and is so important. Wow. And apparently the Supreme Court didn't like that very much. So uh, <laughs> when I started talking about that, um, is, is there one other uh, a comment or question? Yes. Yeah, if you could just introduce yourself. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Rob Nicholas. I'm a retired railroader and I assure you I had no hand in railroading in his <laughs> my, my question is uh is there such a thing that probably maybe in the u.s but i, I don't think in canada but as a prisons for profit and does, does that have any issue about you know making sure there's a you know a steady stream of uh, clientele so i i mean i can speak to the fact that the budget the correctional service of canada budget annually is three billion dollars and um you know one third of the population the federally incarcerated prison population are indigenous people so one of the things that the justice council in british columbia are trying to do is advocate for the reallocation of those resources one billion dollars to indigenous communities to do those prevention uh programs um you know for indigenous people I think the greatest opportunity for change and where we're really going to see a meaningful difference is to stop trying to fix a system that was built to do exactly what it's doing. Mm -hmm. The colonial system yes. was built purposively to take up Indigenous resources, to keep Indigenous people down. So in British Columbia, we have a justice strategy that aims to, of course, reform the system. The commission that James and others have advocated for for years is very important, but it's still tinkering at the edges of a system that is, is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, we have in British Columbia, the provincial government and the federal government on board for our strategy that talks about self-determination over justice and moving Indigenous people out of that colonial system so that communities are doing that healing work and moving away from that punitive system that, as Gregory said, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for anyone. When someone gets well in jail, when someone is better off after having been through the colonial system, that is an anomaly. Um, that is not what happens most of the time. So, Alice, is there is there a, a profit prison system? I mean, oh. there seems to be profit everything in the United States. Yeah, I mean, there is a growing <laughs> private prison industry um, in the U.S., but I also want to reiterate and underline um, what Amanda just shared, because I think that prison is not just simply about the um, financial profits. That is certainly the case, but there is... Um, you know, prison is also an ideology and that ideology mm -hmm. is used to uphold, you know, white supremacy in the United States. So I think and I hear Greg um, agreeing mm -hmm. um, to yeah. much of what Amanda said. So I don't know if he wants to also share some some thoughts, too. Wow. Yeah. No, one thing I want to say to end this is to say, man, is to 
continue to uh, fight. That's all we can do and make and, and continue to make people aware of what's going on. Because if they don't know, they don't care. So hmm. we have to make people care, man. Hmm. And the only way we could do that is to make them know what's going on or allow them to find out what's going on. Because most people don't understand the criminal justice system and what it does. It destroys people. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, James, you had one more thing to add about the new act in Manitoba. Or the yeah, to, to answer uh, the question more, um, when we were last here in July, um, we uh, suggested or asked the government of Manitoba, which was the, then the previous government, that there should be a, a review of all cases of Indigenous persons uh, prosecuted mm -hmm. uh, in the last several decades uh, for serious crimes to determine uh, the integrity of their convictions, what might be called a Conviction Integrity Commission for Indigenous Peoples Convicted of Serious Crimes in Manitoba. There have been uh, such commissions uh, yeah. in the US. Um, in New York, uh, there's been one, and it's in fact released somewhere just a couple of days ago. Um, they, uh, there's one being set up in Montana, I understand, through uh, the Innocence Project, for indigenous persons. Um, and uh, I believe there's one being set up in Illinois as well. So th that's something we proposed. It would require uh, indigenous leadership, for sure. It would require uh, prosecutorial involvement. Uh, it would, we would ask Innocence Canada involvement uh, as well. And uh, with the change in government, uh, we, we, uh, we, we have reason to hope that uh, something like this uh, might be set up. Uh, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll take some time to, to work through, but uh, other integrity, uh, conviction integrity commissions uh, have uh, produced uh, substantial results within 12 months of being set up. So uh, we're hoping that we can set one up in this province and perhaps from there expand it to other provinces as well. And uh, I can't tell you how useful, we haven't really talked about it too much, but uh, one of the things is uh, when you're a person who does a lot of writing, um, my uh, my relatives often uh, have employed me to help them with their Gladue reports. Mm. And Gladue reports have been a, a remarkably effective. I think they often get a kind of a um, misrepresented as being these, um, these are the reports that people, when, when in the cases of convictions, uh, you can talk about the history and the experiences of Indigenous peoples, um, and uh, that's what the Gladue reports are. So I just we haven't talked a lot about that, but I've written a number of them for my relatives and for friends and people I went to high school with and so on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what I want to do is I want to thank two groups of people. The first is, please join me in saying a big miigwech to our panelists online and here live. And a huge miigwech and thanks uh, to Shana, who's going to hate it that I'm going to point, point her out. But Shana, thanks so much for doing all the heavy lifting and organization to help us out here. Thank you, Shana. And uh, I can see the wonderful art that's now been produced. So I, I encourage everybody to take a look at the art. And I'm going to hand this back to Shana to wrap us up at the museum here. So Shana, come on up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nigan. Thank you so much, James, Alice, Greg, Amanda. And I know that there are other people here who are also supporting. Rachel, I know you're here as well. Thank you. Um, I And thank you all for, for coming and for staying late. And now they've taken away the food, so you can't eat any more food, <laughs> which is like really upsetting me. But anyways, um, I, I'm really glad that this ended on hope. Um, I, I know that that when um, when I used to teach human rights, I, I would often say I, I don't te just teach human rights violations. I want to teach human rights possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm and I'm really hoping that we remember that this is not the beginning uh, nor the end of this conversation, but actually beyond conversation, that this is an opportunity and a space for creating what justice can look like. And uh, and thank you all for being critical, for being real, mm -hmm. being vulnerable, and also for providing us a space for being able to create hope. Yes. Thank you very much.